So, hello everyone. Uh, we're here to tell you about the adventure we've had over the last year, building the site, the infrastructure that you've been using, um, show you how we built it, the challenges we faced, and how you used it. Um, and since everything started from the site design, I'll start by introducing Russ from the admin team, who is responsible for it. Yeah, so I'm, for the first time in an infrastructure review, I'm actually going to talk about something, and uh, mostly about the bits of over-engineered technology that we use to actually design and plan the festival. Oh, there we go. So this, we, we signed the contract for this site uh, almost a year ago, actually, I think. It, that was, it seems like a really long time ago. And uh, we've had a couple of site visits up here where we've come up and camped for a weekend and gone around and sort of worked out where everything might go. And it's, it's exceedingly difficult with this site because there's a lot of like, it's, uh, everything has to be on something approximately flat. Uh, but that's, that's not many places around here. And it also doesn't have to, very importantly, the tents don't have to go on top of water mains, as we found out in 2016. And, um, and various other like, more practical things, like where do the roads go, how, how can we use the roads so that we, can't, that we don't have to rent in so much trackway and so on. So this is one of our planning sheets that we did back in like March or something, where we kind of drew in what we thought we had to do. And then this is our CAD plan with all the layers turned on. Um, so it has like the underground services and the power and the um, network and the lighting and ducts and pipes and all sorts, trees, stumps. And uh, that's, that's how the web map is generated. It's generated directly from that, that CAD plan it, it, that we have this increasingly sophisticated pipeline which we can use to turn a CAD plan which is good for precisely planning where things go and making sure that, that you know the tent is not too close to the track or things like that and also and then that turns it into a web map which I completely rewrote this year to be vector and fancy and it mostly works except in some people's weird browsers but it's not my fault. Um, oh yeah, there's a diagram of that because it, which used to be much more much more complicated, but uh, this this is the kind of simplified new diagram which isn't quite as as annoying. And yes, the doc, the docs are out of date. Sorry, as always. We also got signs this year. I'm not sure why I'm talking about these, but um, it's quite exciting actually. Um, the council were like, you should have some signs to tell people to slow down. So I called the AA and I was like, do some signs for us, and they were like, sure. <laughs> And, uh, and, and it was like the easiest supplier I had to deal with, and they didn't even charge us very much. So uh, I, I hope people found them helpful. We didn't really need, all, I don't think we needed all of them, but, uh, but they seemed to work pretty well. And uh, then the, the, the day before we came on site, somebody delivered the bins, um, which was kind of them, but they put them where we were gonna put our initial logistics area. So we then had to move about, I don't know, 10 tons worth of bins, probably not 10 tons. And then they came around a bit later with a bin washing machine, which was, uh, which was exciting. So it was exciting. But now I'm... <laughs> so now I'm gonna talk a bit about our power infrastructure, which I've been perhaps a little bit too much involved in designing this, this time because I decided to completely rewrite the software we used to do it. Um, that's, that's a common theme with EMF. Like, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't quite work the way we need it to, let's write a completely new system. So we have this computer-aided power design system, which, uh, which takes our, power, our main plan, which I showed you before, and converts it in, works out if, if, the, if the plan is valid and the right things are plugged into the right people, the right, the right panels and so on, the right people, yeah. And, uh, and then it spits out lo some lovely graphs. So this is, uh, is, this is one, one third of, of our power this year. Um, I can barely see that, so uh, I, don't know, I don't know how well it's coming out on the expensive projector. Um, so that shows like every single piece of distribution equipment and the links between them and how much voltage drop and prospective fault current and all those things that I've been nerdy about for the last six months. Um, so we've been trying to get, because the EMF power system is entirely done by EMF rather than an external company, we have to make sure that we do all the testing and validation of it. So this is part of that and it tells you whether the cabling is not big enough or various other things. 
and, uh, and flags it all out in this huge diagram. And uh, then, of course, no plan survives contact with the real world. So uh, we, we did put our power order in quite late. Uh, our supplier, Templon, are fantastic. They're actually one of my favorite suppliers, and I do have a list of my favorite suppliers. Um, and um, they, they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to substitute a few things and, and, and move these things around. We don't quite have enough of these, and we don't quite have enough of those. And, and then we ended up with this mess. Um, so we had, oh, that's clipped, it should say 119 power distribution, distribution boards of more than 16 amp, um, five, more than 5,200 meters of power cable, three generators, two of which were 300 kBA and one was 200 kBA, so uh, that's 800 kBA or about 800 watts of power capacity of which we had 130 kilowatts total peak load, like we didn't need those big generators and in fact we didn't order them. They were like, sorry, you'll just have to have these vast 300 kVA generators. Um, somebody went round just now and counted, counted all of the people plugged in and, uh, and apparently there's more than 400. I didn't, I didn't verify that number. So this is, this is the main supply of one of the generators, that's the one up there, and we have these juicy 400 amp cables going, going away from those. And that, that's a container full of all the power distribution that we have, um, several tons of it. And we did a bit of aerial power rigging with some very heavy cable, which was, uh, eh, it worked. It was a little bit wobbly, it didn't fall down, which is good. And uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a small sample of the 400 connections plugged in and a fire extinguisher, because safety first. So in EMF 2016, we had a bit of a problem that we didn't tell you about. Um, over the weekend, we realized that we were getting really close to the wire with fuel. And so we had to get Benny under this telehandler and get him to unscrew the fuel drain plug and, and siphon the fuel out of this telehandler into the generator. <laughs> so this... This time we didn't want to do that, um, so we got, we got some bigger fuel tanks, uh, much bigger fuel tanks, and they all arrived and they dropped them off and then they were like, oh yeah, we've just gone and picked these up from another site and uh, they're all empty. So it was just last Tuesday, they just turned up with all this, this equipment and they're like, oh, the generators are empty. So we, we had to find somewhere to buy 6,000 litres of diesel, um, which is quite a lot of diesel, it's about five grand's worth. And um, they couldn't come until, until Friday, actually, they came. And so we had to get a uh, Templant to chuck us over another fuel tank to, to kind of make do. Um, that's, that's what an empty fuel tank looks like, in case you hadn't seen one before. Um, <laughs> that's what an empty fuel tank in generator internal fuel tank looks like on the, on the left. And uh, yeah, putting the lighting in was a bit of a challenge this time. It turns out this particular site is very, very hard. And uh, usually we put these bits of metal in called put logs, which hold the festoon poles up. We had way more festoon that we could have put up, but um, we, could, we didn't because we couldn't get these things into the ground and we kept bending them or it just didn't work or the telehandler would tip over or something like that. But we got, I don't know if one kilometer is the amount of installed lighting, but uh, for the first time we used LEDs rather than incandescent bulbs, which saves a lot of power and it's also makes lets you wire them into the longer strings, so uh, that's why they all look cool white. We did a bit of sight lighting, finally, thankfully. Last, last, last year, I, or last uh, EMF, I volunteered myself to try and do some of this, but I was way too busy, and we got a load of lights out, and then some art net problem happened and never worked. But now we have an actual sight lighting team, and they've been doing some pretty stuff, and next time it will be even more pretty. That's a guarantee. Um, they're using these off-the-shelf Ethernet to art, ArtNet to DMX nodes and a load of DMX cable and, uh, and a laptop. This, this presentation's been reordered since I last looked at it, which was eight minutes ago or something. Um, this somehow got found somewhere. I'm not sure what was going on there. Did they try and stick it in the socket? It was in the socket, I'm informed. So don't do that. 
like they're not compatible. <laughs> and I'm, now I'm going to leave, uh, leave you with David. Yes, so hello again. I'm David C. from the NOC team, and uh, I'm going to talk to you first about the uplink. Um, some of you who've been to EMF before will recall the first few events, uh, we were running wireless point-to-point -point links, and every time we ran one, we swore we're not going to do that again. Fortunately, this time it wasn't even an option, because you may have noticed that there are many hills around here, um, which would make it basically impossible, even if we had somewhere useful to go to, which we didn't, because we're quite far out here. Um, so planning for this actually began around about the time that we first came to visit the site um, and investigate in August last year. And we quickly realized that we're going to have to get a circuit from a commercial provider somewhere out of the site. But what, what we wanted to do was make it really easy for the supplier to put it in. So we built a cabinet right by the road, ran ducting for them right to the road, so all they'd have to do was in theory, was connect up their duct to our duct, pull some fiber three with the rope that we, we provided. So we were here in January, digging in some very hard ground, getting trenching in for the ducts to the road, power to the cabinet, and uh, some sheep were in the field. This field uh, was not actually a camping field at that time of year, so by popular request, someone keeps tweeting EMF webcam asking for sheep. Here are some sheep. Uh, the, and this is in fact a deer park. We saw deer in the, adjacent fi in the adjacent field as well. We were careful not to interfere with them. Um, so this is what we ended up with. Uh, this is how we left it, and uh, here's how it, we returned to it, full of covered in weeds later, well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, in good condition. Um, in the meantime, the provider had come, hooked up the duct, and... <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, here's an example of uh, just outside that cabinet, in fact. Uh, you can see branching off to the left are two ducts uh, for circuit providers. One we used, one is uh, in reserve for uh, future use. Um, the duct going off to the right, which was hastily added uh, uh, last week, in fact, uh, with some PVC bonding uh, cement and uh, ghetto homemade swept tees, uh, actually comes all the way up here to site because what we discovered using uh, the documentation, fairly, fairly illegible documentation uh, provided by the site, but actually walking through and actually looking at manholes and seeing where things got, went, is that we would, in theory, be able to pull fiber all the way up to the site. Backup plan, same as usual, throw fiber in a hedge, run it down the ditch, throw it away afterwards. Um, so here we are. Uh, this is about 1.2 kilometers of fiber. Uh, we uh, rotted uh, last Sunday. Seems like a month ago. Um, we, the manholes are every 100 to 150 meters, sometimes a bit shorter, but uh, for each one we push this yellow, very stiff rod through, pull back a rope, and then pull the rope back through again all the way. This uh, on the right here is, is the main fiber, eight cores, just in case something goes wrong. And apparently we energized Team Synergy to assemble an enterprise-grade fiber spool unspooling solution. There we go. Um, and yes, this was splicing in the back of a van down by the main gate um, to hook that in. Uh, here is our network operations center, which we got running fairly early. It was the staging point and the distribution point for uh, taking the switches, sending them around the field with the access points uh, to be installed in the Dart and Clow. Um, and as for our data center, well, we've tried a few things over the year. In 2012, we had a rented scout tent with a full 19-inch rack, which worked pretty well, except it was hard to cool and kept getting bits of field in all the, the equipment. Uh, 2014, we had a refrigerated shipping container, a reefer, which was great. It was so cold. It, the problem was it was too cold. You couldn't set the, the set point high enough to stop it constantly chilling. And because the door was opening frequently, people going in and out, it produced a load of condensation that was blown over all the switches and servers, uh, which had to be covered in tarp. So cold, but side effects. 
Um, 2016, we uh, went for what the bar used, which is a, a cool room, basically. Uh, we didn't realize at the time that the inbuilt chiller unit was mostly designed for keeping already cold things cold, uh, so food, drinks, rather than actually cooling enormous amounts of thermal output from switches and servers. So we did actually have to buy aircon at the last minute. But other than that, it worked really well. So that's what we use this year. This is um, the assembly of the cool room, the cloud services data center, the, uh, the former location of the inadequate cooling unit has been replaced by a fiber and <laughs> copper entry port. And this is what it looks like inside. Heavy stuff on the bottom, UPSs, very heavy, um, and the servers. And then from left to right, we have the wireless LAN controllers and uh, some of the Vox uh, the video team's servers. In the middle, we have at the bottom, we have the core switch where every fiber around site is plugged in. Uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. And on the right are those fibers. Yes, you may have noticed that there is no flat on this field, uh, so bodges had to be involved at certain points uh, to stop the air conditioning tipping over onto the servers. <laughs> um, now, the, the NOC DC was actually positioned where it is because we wanted to use the manhole that runs all the way down, or the duct from the manhole that runs all the way down to the front gate. Uh, so unlike previous years, we only had one power feed. In previous years, we've had uh, feeds from two different generators, uh, but this time we didn't. But everything worked fine. We had a resilient pair of UPSs and an automatic transfer switch for the servers that couldn't take uh, dual power supplies, and uh, we had no outages at all. And I'll hand over to Niels. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Niels, and I'll talk a bit about uh, actual stuff out in the fields. Um, this diagram comes from the same uh, CAD system as was used for power distribution. Uh, lots of shared development there. Uh, purple lines are the fiber that goes across the field, so from central places to, to all the data clouds. Uh, the circles are roughly 50 meter diameter circles uh, around each data cloud being 25 meters, kind of a rule of thumb. You don't, can't really expect people to bring longer cables than that. So uh, data clouds spaced out on the field, uh, so that the circles just almost overlap. And uh, if you pay attention to where the purple lines go here, you will have noticed that uh, these are all little islands. And one of the, the big features of this field is that there are, there's infrastructure between several places that we could uh, use uh, to transport data where we didn't have to cross roads. Because road crossings are really annoying to do. Uh, there's lots of traffic always and, and vans and stuff. So, you can't put fibers there, you have to work with ramps, which are expensive and heavy. And uh, this way, with, with lots of cores uh, from uh, between three places on the field, uh, it saves us a lot of hassle in, in deploying uh, a working infrastructure here. So this is the, the duct plan. There were three manholes, and uh, we, we had up to 12 cores between uh, different places. Uh, basically, uh, these, these little LED signs are uh, splice boxes with a watertight cover over them. And uh, at each side, we would break out a couple fibers and uh, the rest would go on. So from, from the core, uh, we, we had a star network. From the core, we could patch everything all the way through to the end of the field without having to have any active equipment all over the place. Oh. Where are we? Right. So this is how the, the network plan looked. This is the logical diagram. Uh, as you can see, everything is connected uh, <coughs> to the, the core switch, to the core router, eSNOR. Um, I'm assuming a, a non-native English speaker wrote that down after hearing a British person say it. And uh, the couple of places where we, we didn't want to run fiber because there were really short distances. Uh, and we, we had a, you know, 10 meters of copper cable. And, and that is the, the bottom layer you see in this diagram. Uh, yeah, it's sideways, but you know, landscape. And uh, this is the physical diagram, which you can see is uh, different. 
And uh, these are not switches, but these are the, the datum clouds uh, all over the field. So, um, for example, you, you can go from the left to the right in this diagram and, and follow the cable uh, from one datum cloud to another all across the field uh, with no active equipment in between except where it says copper. So again, this is coming from a single source of truth, which is really helpful when, uh, when yeah, troubleshooting problems and making sure that everybody knows what actually is the network design uh, that is being rolled out, uh, what VLANs need to be where, uh, and just finding out what is where. This is one of those uh, splice boxes uh, that we had a couple of through the field. Uh, on, on the right side, you see the, the black uh, multi-core fibers, outdoor fibers uh, that run underneath the, the ground come in. Uh, then they're spliced onto pigtails in, in the, the, the white bit with the, the laser warning. And uh, these end up on, on pigtails that are then put into connectors on the left. And all those cables go to the switches. Uh, the connector on the right is the uplink. Connectors on the left all go to the field. Uh, there's two cables coming into this, and, and we had two more of these out in the field. And uh, when the event is over, we roll up all the cabling inside and put the top over it again and put it back in the trench. And then, I don't know, maybe in two years, we can come back and we don't have to do all this splice work uh, that Dave showed all the photos from. The datum cloud for, for people who's who was, for who this was the first EMF. Uh, originally, I think, invented by the Germans, copying a concept from the Dutch. Uh, we locked them because we don't want people to mistake them for what they actually are, uh, normally. Uh, this, you can see there's power going into it, there's fire extinguisher next to it, because it's a nice central place where you can have them. Uh, the, the little wood tower on top has an access point, uh, in a container box upside down. And on top of that is an ohm light, and you will have seen those display fire. They're very good, very useful, because if you walk around the field, you can immediately know, oh, there's the nearest network access point. Uh, and can, you can run your cables there. And shoot it loose, uh, internet connection, then the, the fire flame animation will stop, and you immediately know, oh, there's an outage there that will need attention. This is from the inside. Uh, Cables coming in on the bottom, one going out to the access point and uh, to the ohm light. There's a switch in there, there's a the power distribution unit there. And uh, this one, I think I took this picture on, on like Friday afternoon, so not many people around who had plugged into this one yet. Uh, I don't think we ever ran into a situation this event where we needed to add a second switch because we had needed more than, uh, than 48 ports. So a couple of these ports are of course reserved for our own stuff, like Ohm light needs a connection, uh, the, the DEX phones need a connection, GSM, base stations, uh, and uh, the access points. We had some power over Ethernet switches. Most of the access points were connected via PoE injectors. But this was a PoE switch, I think. Right, stuff that went wrong. One of the, the challenges is you, you start out and you Build, you arrive on site and you build out this little temporary network just because, you know, we need to be online. And the orga is breathing down your neck going, can we check our email yet and everything? We need this for production. So you build something temporary and then as the event starts, you need to move from the temporary setup to the final setup. Uh, we had one little device in one of those cabinets uh, that we had built um, up, up the road uh, to serve as a, a media converter and then we had to take it out. And Whenever we took it out, the, the normal equipment couldn't take over because uh, the traffic just wasn't accepted at the remote end. So this was a link that had three different suppliers involved. So we had to contact them all, have them all debug their little part of it. And then eventually it turned out there was uh, probably some display bug in the switch on the remote end in London that was dropping all the traffic without actually indicating that it was all the traffic. So this is why, in practice, for, for you to notice, uh, IPv6 took until, I think, the afternoon of day one uh, before IPv6 would work, because we needed uh, the new, the final equipment there. Uh, something else, 
We worked for like two hours on getting the switch online via copper uplink. And we changed everything and like the cabling, we crimped it. And, and then finally we're like, okay, uh, let's not use the, the copper SFPs. Uh, this particular switch has 10 gig ports and we put one gig uh, pluggables in there. And normally that works. These, these are multi-rate slots. But after we took them out, you can see that the lights, the green lights on, on the bottom row that are lit up are the link lights. So this switch currently thinks that these ports have a working link, which is obviously not the case, since the pluggables are lying on top of it. So yeah, two hours of uh, re-crimping cables. Drawing in graphs is, is a hobby that certain people took up, where if, if you have a, a public graph, then you know it goes up and down as the day progresses. But if you have significantly more capacity available than you have usage, and uh, you have a place where you can send a lot of traffic from, you can create a nice spike. And it goes up, and then you stop sending traffic, it goes down. And it's all fine and dandy until you don't have much capacity available, and you DDoS the campsite that way. Which is what happened here. We only had a gigabit. It was enough for everything we did here, for all the traffic that the people did, uh, for all the streams to go out and all that, but it dis didn't really have much capacity to, to catch incoming DDoS attacks. So the NOC had to spend time and effort uh, contacting our upstreams, having, uh, identifying the source destination, uh, and we ended up having to take the public dashboard offline uh, from, from uh, being able to be accessed from the world because that was the target of the DDoS attack. And uh, the source was somewhere in a group in Germany who deal with open Wi-Fi network development, so to speak. So yeah, please don't do that. It is annoying and uh, it, it inconveniences everybody on the, uh, on, the, on the site and creates work for a knock. And finally, this, this wiring that you guys have here. <laughs> Luckily, somebody brought stickers to notify us of the problem, uh, which were widely deployed. And uh, I think these were good safety measures. Uh, this isn't my first visit to the UK, and I know that you guys like warning signs and, and safety signage and everything. So the, the European Mainland Federation was, was glad to help out. Of course, Europe being Europe, we, we also propose a solution <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we, we will help you implement two years from now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, this is the problem with having uh, a presentation that you need many teams to work on simultaneously and opening it up, someone will put in a troll slide, thank you, Will. <laughs> oh, Wi-Fi. So, I'll uh, hand over now to AK, who's going to talk about uh, the Wi-Fi distribution through the camp and some, give you some stats. So, um, Wi-Fi. Um, well, it's about um, putting up uh, lots of access points, I guess this slide didn't come in too well. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, shit. Okay. So um, some of the photos are not uh, on here, where that are supposed to be on here. Um, but yeah, we put up a lot of access points around um, around 70 of them. Um, on the left, you see a few of them when they're being staged when we were back in the Netherlands. Uh, on the left, you uh, see an access point mounted to a fence, um, and on the right, you see the access points we have mounted on all the um, uh, all the dot enclosed. So that's actually an uh, indoor uh, access point that's mounted into a plastic box uh, that's uh, used for waterproofing it. So that's a fairly cheap solution to um, use a cheaper indoor access point and um, making it waterproof. Uh, and uh, on the top here, you see also uh, the GSM antenna and uh, one of the ArtNet uh, ohm lights. And there was supposed to be another photo on the right, but we can't see that. So. <laughs> um, some statistics about the, uh, the Wi-Fi deployment here. So we had um, 
Uh, 72 access points uh, deployed, all uh, 8211AC uh, Aruba access points. Um, 2,800 concurrent stations that were um, uh, concurrently connected to the network. And uh, in the course of um, these uh, four days, we've seen around um, almost 6,000 unique devices on the Wi-Fi network. And actually, um, most of the devices connected to the network were actually on Wi-Fi, about 94% of them. So only 6% of those devices were actually connected to the wired network. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, we also had a number of SSIDs. Um, um, well, most of them were encrypted, and some of them were unencrypted. But almost 70% of you guys uh, use the encrypted network, so that's good. And 80% um, of the stations were on 5 gig. Um, I think the badges, they cannot do uh, 5 gigahertz, so that maybe they are taking down the percentage of, uh, of stations on 5 gigahertz. And um, of course, 5 gigahertz has way more capacity than 2.4 gigahertz. Um, we're also, um, here in the UK, they, uh, the Ofcom opened up a little bit more spectrum, so uh, they added five more five gigahertz channels. So we were able to use uh, uh, 24 uh, five gig channels, opposed to four uh, 20 megahertz channels on 2.4. So there's way more um, spectrum to play around with on five gig. So please use five gigahertz, and yeah, maybe uh, 2.4 can maybe go away at some point, but. Mm. Uh. Um, yeah, some more statistics in this slide. Um, uh, you guys were able uh, to actually uh, use a random username password uh, on the encrypted Wi-Fi, but uh, apparently not. Well, almost none of you um, actually uh, tried to do this. So um, it's EMF and anonymous and um, some Adderome um, realms that are in this top ten. So. Um, not much exciting things going on. On the, uh, the different uh, operating systems uh, we've seen on the network, uh, Linux is uh, on number one, so that's good. So. Uh, and for some reason, there's Windows 98 there. That cannot be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, uh, we also collect a lot of more data about the Wi-Fi network, like uh, we can look at how many clients that are associated to the different access points spread across the site. Um, so one thing we can do is we can look at how many clients are in a certain room. So we can um, use this data to see which um, presentations are popular. So we, we can see that apparently the most popular talks were uh, banned from encrypting and the making of the tilde MK4. Uh, and also, yeah, Hackers was very popular yesterday, so it was good. And Sidebar was also crowded yesterday. Oh, right now. And, and Millie Ways was also popular yesterday, so <laughs> something with WikiLeaks, I guess. Um, so that was it for Wi-Fi. Uh, we have some other statistics. Um, yeah, so we have this one gig uplink, and we, uh, yeah, it was uh, saturated, so um, because, thanks for that, yeah, so next year we have to have more bandwidth, so, or next two years we have got to go for 10 gig or something, yes. So. Um, yeah, this is the, so we see a couple of peaks there, but that might have not been genuine traffic, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get more, I guess, next year. Um, yeah, so temperatures. Um, yeah, it was uh, last night it was pretty okay uh, during the night, but uh, the night before that it was very, very, very cold. So you can actually see uh, about a, uh, I think it's a 20 degree difference with during the, the day and during the night. So uh, if you're looking at the temperatures of all the switches we have on site. So I think, yeah, it's yeah probably 20 degrees difference uh, between day and night. So that was, Pretty cool. Uh, I think that's it for statistics. So uh, we're going to move on to video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, so some of you may have noticed uh, we haven't done our usual thing of having uh, very strange graphs like radiation level or Club Mate stock in the bar. Uh, this is mainly due to everyone being absolutely knackered by the time all the logistical uh, issues were sorted out. Uh, but now I will pass over to a team far more professional and streamlined than our own, uh, the CCC Video Operations Center, and pass you over to Vossi. So, hi everybody, I'm Wadi from the CC Rock, which is the video team of the CCC from Germany. Uh, let's start with a few statistics of our live streams. So, we had around 100 viewers at the peaks, uh, up to 120. Uh, most of the people were watching uh, MPEG Dash live streams, which is like an adaptive live stream technology. And uh, Apple devices mostly use HLS, and some legacy devices watch the IceCast streams. Those are statistics from our ticket tracker. So overall, we recorded 117 events. Uh, 26 events were not recorded. Those were either uh, speakers that didn't want to be recorded or music and movie events that aren't being, being recorded. And overall, that's almost 62 hours of uh, video being recorded by us. And most of the stuff is already online on, and you can watch it. So we also faced some challenges at EMF. Uh, first, uh, those tents arrived late, and uh, we had to do everything at Friday morning, and it was really stressful. But uh, we got we got it. So and uh, during the build-up at ten, uh, stage B, there were some power outages, which also didn't help. Uh, for the first time at this event. Uh, we all normally re render our uh, videos with an intro at the, at the beginning, which is like a small video which says who's the speaker and which what, what name the talk has. Uh, the guys from EMF wanted it to be like a transparent uh, lower third thing, and we had to build it in our pipeline, And but uh, at the end it worked out, and so now every video starts with a lower third which has transparency and overlays over the video. Uh, one talk actually had an emoji in its title, which was a little bit challenging. Uh, but everything worked, expect the uh, automatic intro generation, so I had to fix this uh, manually. But apart from that, it's already up on YouTube and on our own platform, and everything worked. <laughs> uh, and actually, on this stage, uh, one HDMI splitter uh, was bricked by uh, a Tesla coil, and so on this stage, we have some problems with like the, the video on the projector, but I think it's working now. <laughs> so. Thanks for the appreciation. Uh, we also really like this big uh, lucky cat. Uh, and you can find all the recordings up to now. And some are missing uh, at uh, media.ccc.de and on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, so many of you will already know for the first time at EMF we have a deck network that has been very well received. Uh, this was put together by uh, the event phone team who are testing out their new system here. Unfortunately, uh, they have had to leave early. They've kindly left their equipment in our care. Um, but Sam will be talking on their behalf and he's also going to talk about the GSM network that he built. Thank you. So yes, uh, my name's Sam. Uh, I've been involved in building the phone network, mostly the GSM, um, but the kind of, as we'll show you, we had like a common core. Uh, so I worked really closely with Thomas and, uh, and the deck, the event phone guys with the deck stuff. Um, this is Thomas's presentation that I've seen once. So this is kind of risky. I don't know where he might have slipped in there. Um, so first thing really, we, uh, as you see, one of the big things that event phone put in this year was uh, self-service for deck registration. Those of you who've been to Congress before, you know, like signing up, waiting to get your deck phone online had to be kind of um, a fairly manual process, one, one registration at a time. Um, so they put a lot of work into building a service the way you could just register. So the, the deck antennas were effectively always in registration mode, so you could just pick up your phone and say, register to network, um, it was a default pin. That, kind of gave you a temporary allocation on the network um, with a, a really long number that wouldn't route anywhere. And then you could register your number in Guru and uh, just dial the activation code, which actually then like reprovisioned your phone. So um, that was, I think that was quite a lot of work. I think it's worked really well for them. Um, I think most people found that was, that was fairly good. Um, it also meant that that number registration Guru system we built 
was not just for DECT, but actually we extended it to cope with the same for GSM and well for SIP, so you could just SIP register a phone. So I've been using my iPhone with just an application on it all weekend. Um, I haven't actually even got my DECT phone out of the box, but um, you actually had like three different ways to access the same phone system, and you could have a number on, on any of them, and you can have call groups um, and that kind of thing. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's worked really well. The kind of principles we could apply then from DEX to GSM. Um, unif so kind of unified experience across the networks. Really, we have one phone system, different access channels. Um, things that they've learned for EMF. Um, the capture, those of you that signed up very early on in Guru, I think found the capture significantly challenging. Um, either that or everybody was a robot. But, uh, <laughs> So there was a, a little bit of a, yeah, we'll turn down the, the aggressiveness on the capture. Um, displaying SIP details. It's mostly been kind of UX type things in, in like in any web application. Um, they added call groups as well. I don't know if anybody found that, but if you had like, you could get a number that would ring multiple extensions. So if you wanted like a number for your village that would ring six people's decked and GSM phones in the village, you could register that um, as well. That was kind of a late addition. So this is kind of what the, uh, the IP architecture looks like. Um, so we ran, uh, the, in terms of hardware, all these servers were running um, VMs that David kindly provided for us. Uh, so we had these built up a, a little bit ahead of time and then moved to site. So there was a Yate, which is a, yet another telephony engine that you might be familiar with. Uh, it's a SIP, um, SIP control platform. So there was a number of Yate instances, uh, which was kind of handling each segment of the network for, for, for VoIP. So the DEC stuff gets converted into SIP as well, as does the GSM, which I'll show you over there. Um, so we had a, a kind of a VoIP core server. Then we had the decked antennas, you'll see on that cloud. Um, so they were running, that's a private VLAN across the site. So all the decked antennas were plugged into a, a specific switch port on, on the VLAN. Um, and then the GSM BTSs over on the right there. Similar principle to the decked antennas. We actually, um, so the, the, the hardware, for those of you who haven't seen some of the other presentations, the GSM base station is a Raspberry Pi and a, an SDR radio. So we have a Raspberry Pi, we have a, you know, a, dev, um, a Raspberry NOS on there. We could just run an open VPN. So the BTS itself just plugs in, fires up an open VPN tunnel back into our VoIP core and then runs the, the GSM over there. Um, what was really nice was it meant that actually I have, I've had one of these base stations plugged in at home on my DSL when I've been doing testing via the same VPN. So we can actually deploy a base station anywhere in theory with that, that technology. And we didn't have to kind of rely on a custom VLAN for that. Um, just some management stuff over on the outside, and then you'll see the little logo over there, so quick plug for my employer, um, Nexmo, who kindly gave us a bunch of credit to make so all the external calls, traffic out to the, the PSTN, was routed out through them. Um, we have the two little GSM servers at the top there. The GSM core is the Osmocom uh, core network in a box stack, so that was providing our, uh, for those of you who know the GSM acronyms, the MSC, the BSC, and the HLR, and the SMSC, um, were all running in, in one on that box. Uh, that just turn, has a SIP interconnect, so that came out over SIP um, that way. And then the GSM services was just an asterisk box for doing a few little hacks and tweaks, and we put a few little services on there and test numbers, and generally it just gave me a box to, to do some manipulation. We also routed the outbound traffic to Nexmo through that, and the inbound. For those of you that found the inbound, there was a UK number you could dial, um, it would just give you dial tone. So from your regular mobile, um, and then you could dial anything as if you were on site. So you could dial people from off site, could call uh, 07520660900, and you'll just get dial tone. So this was what was on the, the network. Um, we don't know exactly how many GSM devices attached to the network. We know we had 1900 GSM enabled devices um, at some point, but we don't have great stats on, on the traffic on there. Um, that could have been literally just one location update or phones attempting to location update, so people's phones that may have tried to register and been barred or something like that. Um, 277 decked phones, uh, 70 SIP extensions, and 33 people signed up for a personal SIP number, a personal GSM number. So with the SIMs we gave you in the badges, we used a similar thing to decked, but actually you'll find they all had a number, which was that four, one, two, three, four number. Um, you could you keep that number and just use it, which is what people that got their GSM working did. Um, but equally, you could have like reassigned it yourself to a personal number as well. Uh, so the active calls going out to the, uh, to the real world. Um, we had this little problem, as you can see here on, uh, I think it was, well, started at just after 4 a.m. on Friday morning, is that? Um, through till sometime 12 o'clock. Um, basically, somebody hooked up one of their SIP extensions to their SIP server rather than to a phone. 
and their SIP server wasn't a particularly well protected server. So somebody out on the internet, um, anybody that's ever put a, ser a SIP server on the internet will know it takes about 20 minutes before somebody starts trying to poke you with call attempts. They poked their server, they found, oh look, it can make outbound calls via our server, and that burnt through about a thousand euros of credit calling Serbia. Um, <laughs> so uh, I had to have an awkward conversation with my boss then on uh, Saturday morning going, that thousand euros of credit you gave me for EMF, um, I've kind of lost it. <laughs> uh, can I have some more, please? But fortunately, he did. Um, I just checked the balance, and actually, since we locked that connection down, and we, we put a few limits, we blocked SIP for outbound calls, but from DEX and GSM, we've actually only used 60 euros of credit um, of, of legitimate calls, so uh, outbound and inbound. So yeah, that was definitely some fraud there. Um, we did only allow UK, Europe, and US prefixes anyway, which should have generally blocked out the obvious four definite destinations I kind of missed, maybe Serbia. Um, that will go in my band list for next time. Um, this is one uh, quite interesting little thing from the DEC network. So the DEC base stations all need to synchronize with each other because it's a time division multiple access system, so all the base stations need to be on a synchronized clock. Um, we don't have this on GSM, which is why we don't have handover right now. What the DECT system can do is they synchronize over RF links between them. So all these lines are, you'll see the spots are where all the DECT antennas are. So you can even see the one right down at the gate. So there's one in the DK at the gate there. And they actually discover each other. And even a red link is a low quality, um, red, yellow, green quality links. But these would all keep them in synchronization. So they're synchronizing over the DECT RF band with their, uh, with their channels. Um, couple of plugs. Uh, yeah, the challenge for Event Phone is they're trying to get more followers on Twitter and YouTube, so they're clearly trying to break into social media. Um, uh, very quickly, the GSM stuff. Um, challenges we had, the time frame, getting it all built, really, I was being pushed. Um, you know, we were right up against it, and we were reliant on so many other bits of infrastructure, so, so we got pushed out there. Deploying the BTSs in the real world. Um, we all this stuff worked really well on, in the test in the lab and Lime SDR built the boxes and I've had stuff running on my desk at home for weeks. Um, turns out when you start sticking it on a wooden pole in a field, some of the environmental things. So uh, Thursday night, I think it was, was furiously spent soldering additional 5 volt power lines. Raspberry Pis, USB power, anybody that's been there will, will know that. Um, and yeah, manpower, woman power. Um, I really kind of ended up doing nearly all, most of the GSM stuff myself with a bit of help from Thomas. Um, a big shout to uh, Yaga, if she's here, who helped um, putting up the base stations on Thursday and then went around and took them all down when I said, actually, what I thought was a software problem is a hardware problem and I need to solder some wires into them, so can you go and get them all down again and bring them back, please? And then put them all back up again. Um, again, so yeah, she, uh, she deserves excellent work. Yeah, so we can see uh, we can see where the GSM was busy. Surprise, surprise! Not many people are making GSM calls at four in the morning. Um, but you know, there's a, a traffic distribution graph there. Thank you, David. So uh, at EMF, we're always uh, trying to keep the ticket price as, as low as possible in order to encourage and make it available to as many people as possible. And we have to always balance that versus things that we actually need, like, or people expect, like an internet connection. Paying for an internet connection uh, and equipment and set up about the size of a small ISP that is used for a weekend and then thrown away for two years isn't really something we can afford, uh, nor would we actually want to. So we rely on the enormous generosity of a whole slew of sponsors uh, to lend us equipment, services, uh, and other, uh, other favours. Um, I'd like to give a particular shout out this year to Sky for Business, who, uh, without whom we'd have no uplink at all. Our uplink uh, goes via a circuit to a nearby town where they have a point of presence and they take it to London from, for us. We had very few options there and they were awesome. Absolutely uh, many thanks to them. Um, and I'd also like to thank the others who I'm just going to read out very quickly because we're out of time. Event Infra, Flex Optics, Sargasso Networks, Lonap, Comtech, Clarinet, Babiel and Arista. So many thanks to them. I also want to thank the volunteers who pop by from time to time offering to run around the, the Dartenclay to 
plug people in. Uh, we need your help again to unplug them. Um, and beginning tomorrow at 9 a.m., we begin teardown. That's bringing back all the cables, all the fibers, all the switches. If you're able to help out, please come by at 9 at the knock tent. I think that's it. Uh, these slides will be on our GitHub, and here's our Twitter. Thank <laughs> you.